Okay, um, welcome to this event by the Center for Philosophical Studies of History. My name is Georg Gangel and I will be today's moderator. Um, today's speaker is Kalle Pichleinen with the topic um, history and para-history, a complex and delicate relation. Um, Kalle is currently a lecturer in history of science and ideas at the University of Oulu and he's also a member and in that sense a colleague at the Center for Philosophical Studies of History. Um, Kalle's main research areas are um, questions of historical representation and the uses of history in academic and popular context. And I think at least about the latter, we will also hear today if I understand Kalle's title correctly. Um, Kalle is also editor or one of the editors of Rethinking History, one of the um, three main journals, I would say, in our field, the history and philosophy, uh, the theory and philosophy of history. Um, he has also in recent years published one book. Um, the book is called The Work of History, Constructivism and the Politics of the Past. That was published in 2017. And if I remember correctly, it also has been translated into Portuguese and Spanish, or at least one of the two. Um, and, uh, in Spanish? Yes, in Spanish. So if you um, would like to look at it in that language, you can also do so. And very excitingly, um, today's talk, Kalle told me will be the introduction of a new book he's currently working on, or the new book, the introduction will be based on today's talk. And that book bears the title, or maybe the working title, um, Bear Para History and the Popular Past, Acts of Historical Production. Um, now, of Kalle's most recent publications, I only want to mention one here. And this is the uh, article, History, Culture, and the Continuing Crisis of History which was last year published in a special issue of the journal Farabit, Journal for Histor Historical and Archaeological uh, Studies. Um, here I have the journal, this is the journal, I have the print issue here, I'll tell you in a minute why. Um, and this um, issue was a special issue on the concept of history culture or historical culture. And it was edited um, by Leonie Marti Kukanen, the um, director of the Center for Philosophical Studies of History with, uh, in Oulu, and it also has Next to Kalle, it has a text from Joni Mati Kukan and Ilka Lechtemaki, myself, and a few other uh, writers and scholars. Um, and all the texts are open access and available on the journal's homepage. So if you're interested in history, culture, historical culture, and more what Kalle has to say, I invite you to look at the journal's texts and you find them online. If you're interested in any of, other, of, of the many other publications of Kalle, um, I encourage you to look at Carla's homepage. It's carlepichlander.com. He has a very well-kept and good homepage and there you find all information and you find also find links to most of his texts so they are available in PDF. Now, um, this is the fourth and last session of our spring seminar. Our seminar will go on a, a little break, summer break after that. However, um, we will continue <laughs> in September with our seminar and there are already first preparations and plans for the autumn seminar. But as of yet, we still have some open slots as well. So um, if you are interested in speaking in our seminar, this is the format, this is the venue, um, please contact us and we will see if we can fit you into into our um, seminar schedule for the autumn. But um, this today is not our last event before the summer break. In actually exactly two weeks time, 9th, November, 9th of June, 9th and 10th of June, two days, we will have the workshop, the future of philosophy of history in Oulu. Um, we're very proud that it's going to happen now. It's looking very likely it's going to happen. It had to be postponed for COVID twice. But for this workshop, we have invited eight international um, scholars, accomplished scholars, but also young scholars. And by young here, I mean young in the academic sense. So um, not uh, on the, uh, rather lower still on the ranks of the academic career ladder. And, but so in that sense, young. Um, and the idea was to discuss with them the future of philosophy of history. So in the sense, um, we have invited the future of philosophy of history to discuss, uh, to, to discuss the field's future with us, in a sense. Um, this event will also be live streamed and um, recorded. If you are interested in participating from afar or watch it afterwards, please um, consult our homepage. All the information about the workshop is there, like abstracts, the, uh, the timetable schedule and, and the, 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 the titles. Um, and also very soon we will publish um, the the, the actual links for the for the participation online for Zoom. Um, and generally, if you want to stay updated about what we are doing, which you think is a very good idea, then please follow our social media on Twitter or Facebook. We are sort of reasonably active on there. Now, that was it from my side, basically, but there are still technicalities in the very end. Um, please mute yourself during 
colorless talk so as to avoid unnecessary noise and disturbance. And um, after the talk, there will be a discussion session that I will moderate. If you have any questions or concerns or sort of comments, please um, indicate so first in the chat. I will make a speaker's list. Then when it's your turn, you can either speak up with or without your camera on, or you can write a question in the chat and then I will read out. Um, and we will also prioritize people who haven't spoken yet. So they will move up on the speaker's list. Now, and as a very last point of concern or point of order, maybe um, Kali also told me that he likes to see faces while he's active, while he's doing the, all the hard work here. So please consider turning your camera on. So this was it for me. Thank you very much, Kale, and you have the word. Thank you. Thank you, Georg, for the introduction. And nice to see so many of you here. We just realized it's a public holiday, or we were discussing how we realized after scheduling this that it's a public holiday today in many countries. So I appreciate the effort. Um, I see a lot of faces, which is also nice. So nothing to worry about there. Um, I want to quickly say something about the title, History and Parahistory. I, I, the title suggests I'm going to discuss the relation of it. Um, I won't talk so much about the definitions, but hopefully the relation between history and parahistory will become, or is, is the focus to some extent, as I say, in the title, or promise in the title. As Georg said, hopefully this will soon be the introduction to a book I'm working on. And the article Georg mentioned there, I do try and define what parahistory, what I mean by parahistory. It's something which Hayden White says in, in passing, which no one really picked up on this term, but I find it quite useful, although I won't really use it in this. Let's just say the suggestion is that we have history on one side and then everything, all the talk about the past, which isn't disciplinary history, would go under that broad label of parahistory. So it's a way to divide up a broad history culture in a way where academic history can be somehow distinguished. Although, as I, I will say in the paper, it's, it's a very moving boundary. And, and that is what interests me precisely, is that moving boundary, the nature of that moving boundary. So the crucial challenge, as I see it, is, is that uh, what's accepted as history is changing all the time. And most of the time when we theorize it in these kinds of discussions, we're not really up to date with the practice of, of history. So we're talking about history in, in quite narrow senses and not always matching what practicing historians do. Um, in addition to trying to show what a moving, moving target that boundary is, I tried to give an analysis of some of the reasons and criteria that have been given in these discussions for trying to fix it in place. And obviously that fixing in place has been quite unsuccessful. I wanted to share with you a, not a PowerPoint, but a Prezi, if we can manage to do that, just to have, I'm going to use some quotes and give you some images and, and something to follow visually as well. Why? While we're going, um, I think, oops, sorry. I think I can change that to, yeah. Okay. And that means I want to move you around so I can still, this is just me talking out loud, but I want to move things around enough to see some faces still, if I can. There we go. No. <laughs> Apparently I can't it to my satisfaction. So let's keep going then. I will have to forget about looking at expressions closely anyway. So um, that was the title. I want to start out just uh, by, sorry about the technical problems. Now I don't know how I can deal with my screen here that I'm sharing. For some reason it's not doing what I'd like to see it do. I will have to go back to the other view for a second. So I would like to start with um, just not to advertise the journal as much, but just to start with the experience of the journal rethinking history. The journal is looking at also at historical practice, not only theory. And the experience I've had over a couple of decades, I've been editing it for five or six years now, but I published in it very early on in my career. And the experience I've had following it is that uh, we get a lot of innovative submissions to do with the practice of writing history. And, and these initial innovations are very often very interesting. And then um, they tend to push the envelope a little bit. And then we start getting presentations which just follow the same standard. And then there's a break before anyone comes up with anything. 
anything again innovative and i guess that's the nature of innovation but the thing is that uh, also that these innovations don't seem to stick so there's a self-censoring in in the field of history i think which very often returns it to the traditional ones but one that i wanted to share with you from rethinking history is uh by jonathan walker he, he did an article i think it was 2005 where he he uses a lot of different both linguistic and uh comic strip and other, other visual materials to make his point. But the interesting thing about the way he, he there pushes the envelope is, is that with these other media, he's still very strict in accounting for things in a, uh, let's say, uh, conservative historical fashion. So everything's well documented, well researched and so on. And yet, despite that, there were a lot of object objections to it as not counting as history for many, many viewers or readers um, and the question really that I want to look at throughout this is what counts history what counts as history how we push that boundary as I said um, so basically again talking about change but change mostly to do with with form because uh, we could think of change in terms of content as well as form and obviously for history you have you have uh, change in content all the time that's that's the main drive of the profession itself. So what we know changes, the interpretations change, and that's just a basic feature of history. So since we have limited time now, I won't look at that, I'll just talk about form. And uh, the main thing I want to do in relation to form is to outline some ways for thinking about the basic commitments of historical work with respect to the limits they set on formal expression, the way we express things, different representational strategies. And then also look at the different presentational forms available and how, how that already that discussion has been on, going on for several decades. Just briefly look at some of the high, high points of that discussion. And roughly, to, to give you a preview, roughly what I'll go over in this order is uh, look at quickly at the pressures for change coming from theory and philosophy, and then at the historian's position on those same issues, and then three central ways of approaching what might be called alternative histories or experimental histories. Mm, I wanted to just show you from Walker, I know just, just one sort of visual thing where when he's writing the history, he'll have things like bang, bang, you're dead there and sort of very experimental in terms of just the linguistic representation, but also then in the cartoon or the comic strip, sorry, where, where he'll have very well-documented historical materials. And as he says in this, this caption here, evoking the evanescence of life, but also evoking the time, time period of that. So already you can see ways of pushing these boundaries, which a lot of, let's say, traditional historians might not be, or don't seem to be as comfortable with. But uh, this is sort of really at the edges of the envelope of historical representation right now. I think, and I will sort of take some st steps back and look at the literary, literary form still as well. Um, the main thing to keep in mind is that our representations are made in different media and for different audiences in very different contexts, but there is, of course, a common purpose. It's all aimed at communication. So our presentation should be able to accommodate to this communicative function and in that change change is desirable and in inevitable because audience sensibilities change also all the time but but despite that what's not always obvious i think when we think about these things is that the field changes so the acceptable ways of defining history also do change um, in part it's because of the way history is defined And uh, again, in that definition, there's a strong resistance to change. We have a focus on epistemology. There's a clear methodology in some aspects of history, at least some areas of history. And of course, there's a very strong professional ethic. So there's resistance also to, to, the, to the change. But uh, there is a change also because history for historians is very much content driven. And when we present different content, we are also, also um, inevitably having to match our representations to that content. Uh, 
but but that's still that aspect of internal change or change because of what historians want to do is is out of sync in a way to audience sensibilities and um, regardless of whatever disciplinary demands we might have uh, broader cultural storytelling sensibilities also change and that's something we don't i think include enough in these discussions and it's particularly so for the audience this change because they're not subject to the same kind of disciplinary formations as historians, obviously. Um, and then we have our theory of history, philosophy of history debates and historians internal debates as well, of course, about a discipline and practice where are internal challenges to it. Why history? What does history do? Who is history for? And of course, we've discussed this very, very broadly as a field of theory and philosophy of history, so I won't go into those very much. The, uh, there's a crucial ethical question also to do with this experimental alternative form, the challenge of the form. And that's uh, something which already comes very strongly in existentialist and post-structuralist philosophy, especially discussion of postmodernism and the linguistic term, which is that we need to be able to separate content and form. And, and the, the the consequences of that, I think, I, my feeling is, in my own work, they still haven't been fully, fully explored. So we still get hung up on epistemological questions and don't see that shift when we make a move from content to form, but it's also a shift from the epistemological to ethical and broader social issues, even when we're talking about things as, as a fact, fact fiction controversy or something like that. The main takeaway I think is, is familiar to all of you, of course, is that, that we need to understand that there's some meaning always created and imposed. And quite often that's, that's most visible in, in the ethical and consequential discussions that we have about what history does, what history is, and what impact it has. So, so I said I'd start with uh, some of the objections to conventional history from some of the theory and philosophy debates, and I will start if I can, let me just, um, I'm having trouble with my Pretzi because I haven't used it for a while, but yeah, okay, it's going right way. So start with Sandy Cohen from his book, French Theory in America, where he says very well, critical theory of history tries to change the rules of writing history, or even to ask if any game of writing, his, writing about history is worth it. That is a harsh thing to say, but the theorists discuss the French theorists basically are in agreement that after 2000 years, 2500 years of misrepresentation by historians, by the sheer hit and miss of historical representation and so on, it's time to consider not playing the game. So Sandy is, I think, very far. And he's, he's the more radical in this, as is Keith, who we're lucky to have here today. Um, I want to just explain a few things from a quote for, again, for, for purposes of discussion. Um, one is this 2,500 years. I, in my abstract, I think I said history has lasted to, to about 200 years. And again, this is part of how we define it. And the other thing I, I, that might come up in discussion, I think we should discuss it because when we look at, uh, well, I'll come to that later. Um, the other, other thing, that last line there, second to last line, control of the future is of course important because that is, by many of the more extreme critics. I, I agree, it seems to be the function of much of what we call, what we could think of as disciplinary, so more traditional history. The, the other quote I wanted to quickly give you, I have three quotes from theory and philosophy of history, all on the radical side. The other one is from Hayden White, who, who makes the argument already in the 60s, um, that historians of that generation must be prepared to entertain the notion that history as currently conceived is a kind of historical accident a product of a specific historical situation. And then when that situation changes, we might just happily do away with, with history. And he places on those last lines of that quote, the challenge to this generation of historians, or that 60 generation, but something which still hasn't happened, is that they will be called upon to perform, um, sorry, a difficult task they will be called upon to perform is to expose the historically conditioned character of the historical discipline. And that, of course, relates to, to again, how we've been defining history in various ways. Already this idea of whether it's something which has lasted 2,500 years or which is a product of, of a very specific uh, 
economic and, and social situation. Um, regarding White's this quote, yeah, I think the question I most want to emphasize is his idea that it's a historical accident and it might be time to, to rethink it, history as we know it. But White is not quite as radical as Cohen. His, but he also wants at, the, at a bare minimum to transform history, to let it be updated to what I, in my, my start of my presentation, I, I try to think of as uh, mostly audience and reading and reception sensibilities, because history is very much out of date in respect to those, even if it is uh, on the research side, still sometimes, often quite respectable. And both uh, Cohen and White are, of course, uh, very reminiscent of Friedrich Nietzsche, who they take their inspiration from. So I wanted to give also a quick quote from Nietzsche just to back that up. Um, according to Nietzsche, or, or he argues, may our estimation of a historical be but an occidental prejudice, as long as within these prejudices we make progress and do not stand still. And this is the classic, of, of course, from Nietzsche, as long as we constantly learn to improve our ability to do history, to do history sorry, for the sake of life. And again, he's, he's similarly querying the usefulness of, usefulness of doing history, not in this bit quite as radical as, as Cohen, closer to White. He wants us to do a pragmatic turn, as it were, in, in current vocabularies, and agrees that if we're going to do history, we can do it, but we should have some good reason for it. And of course, his reason is a strongly presentist or consequentialist one. What's the effect of our histories? Why are we doing it? What the goal might be for Nietzsche, as for White, as for Cohen, if we continue doing it, as for Keith here, I, I would say it is emancipation, although of course you have different levels of how acceptable it is still to keep doing it after all these decades of failures, according to the critics. Um, and, and a lot of these theoret theoretical debates, as, as many of you know, have been um, going on under different uh, labels of alternative histories, unconventional histories, experimental histories. And, and alongside that theoretical discussion, there's a bunch of historians who are doing really brilliant alternative work. And I'll show some examples of that first. But, but before that, I want to sort of take one, one step back in this discussion and look at where, well, let's say, go to a parallel and look at what historians have been saying at the same time, and even slightly before, a lot of these theoretical challenges really found their voice to that extent. Um, I hope that all makes sense so far. As I said, I, I had to lose your faces to, to be able to do this. And I can't uh, uh, negotiate my, my screen and the different tabs very well. Um, so I hope that all makes sense. Uh, what a question that, of course, then is important is to specify the problems with so-called conventional histories or traditional history and, and say why specifically we need these alternative histories. And obviously this is something many of you have spent a lot of time working on already. The, the arguments are that conventional history is an attachment to power. It's an attachment to conventional values or exhibits an attachment to conventional values. As Cohen said, it's for the control of the future. Like, like Nietzsche often says also, it's about control. Um, and there are two ways of, of seeing it as attached to power. I think this, this is the easiest way to think about that is to go back to Nietzsche and say either it's a history that strives for closure or various closures, what Nietzsche would probably have called the monumental or this definition is slightly, slightly different. But anyway, that sort of monumental history or more conventional history now is, is always striving for a closure and the other alternative to, to keep, remain attached to conventional values, of course, is what Nietzsche calls the antiquarian attitude or stance, which is where you focus on content, not on the significance of what you're doing, basically ignore the significance. And that's another easy strategy for keeping the status quo. And then critics like uh, Cohen White um, would be doing more what, what they call radical history, following very much the ideas of radical democracy, which um, Keith Jenkins presents very well, I think, after Laclau, for those who are interested in reading up on that. 
The basic idea there is that uh, conflict and controversy are a core part of our social makeup. They stem from different social positionings and interests and, and history should somehow be in service of that discussion if it's going to be, um, if, it's, if we're going to continue engaging in, in, in doing history. So if, it's, if it should do anything as a discipline, it should be able to support those kinds of uh, positionings and interests and drives. And, and it shouldn't be a problem because that's something historians are really well trained to do to the extent that they're able to contextualize things in um, contemporary discourses or, or contemporary to whatever they're examining. But then this uh, presentist, in that presentist uh, moment, they don't necessarily utilize the same tools which they've been so well trained to do as historians relating phenomena to the context of their past. So they're very adept at describing specific phenomena and circumstances, including all the problems that people have in, in, and the controversies and the social, social challenges and so on. But for some reason, they don't so much apply that to, to the significance of their own work. Of course, add generalization, but that's part of a disciplinary definition and understanding again very easily. But there, uh, as I wanted to show with some quotes, is there are some beautiful examples of explanation of context and change in conventional history from a strictly theoretical point of view, of course. So we have a lot of, a lot of amazing history classics. You have uh, Febre's the Problem of Unbelief in the 16th century, Jacques Le Goff's Birth of Purgatory, or Huizinga's Waning of the Middle Age, these real classics, which also have a strong theoretical component to them. Um, but often the form of uh, conventional history does disempower historians of these texts from having that kind of radical, radical interpretation, radical impact. And, and of course, that's something which is uh, redoubled with the discipline's emphasis on distance, because this idea of distance and staying away from presentism in terms of one's work's consequences and so on, that is also a disempowering component. Um, and, and because of the various dynamics, the insights that could be radical very easily become incorporated into history as a discipline history with a capital H as this, this sort of general acceptable work relating to the past. So they're normalized as the way things are or just presented as being too alien, too different. So, so we either have again, the normalization process or this idea that they're marginalized as curiosities. And that's of course not news for practicing historians today. I think ideally we're all very much aware of that and uh, well, we're here to discuss the possibility for of opportunities for history and history. So I assume you all know that very well. But I, I do want to remind how clear eyed many historians have been for a very long time about all this stuff. And um, I wanted to take Arlette Farge, a quote from Arlette Farge, I think, who's a very exemplary historian also on the research side from, from her book, The Allure of the Archives, because I think she gives a wonderful description of historians' relation to the archive and, and that aspect of work. There's a final chapter also where, where she looks at the process of writing. So she's not only looking at the archive, but finally in the last chapter, she also looks at what historians do when they write. And uh, she says, we we'll follow, yes, that's the right one. Historical writing should retain the hint of the unfinished, giving rein to freedoms even after they were scorned, refusing to seal off or conclude anything, and always avoiding received wisdom. It should be possible to find new ways of bending our words to the rhythm of the surprises experienced when in dialogue with the archives, forcing them to partner with, inte with intellectual hesitation so that we can see both crimes and desires for emancipation as they appeared in the moment, holding on to the possibility that each would be wedded later on to other dreams and other visions. So again, very theoretically sensitive from, from a present uh, perspective, giving rein to the freedoms even after they were scorned, always avoiding received wisdom, uh, exemplifying intellectual hesitation and seeing the surprises, seeing, seeing that things can also be interpreted in many ways and that our pre-interpretations sometimes contradict and even our main interpretations sometimes contradict with other aspects of what's going on. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to go too far quickly. Um, 
I think most important thing is that historians like Farge do exhort us to focus on showing the possibilities open to historical subjects at the time. They emphasize the idea of surprise. They avoid imposing, they, they consciously, very consciously, avoid imposing their own expectations and re received wisdom and avoiding all these kinds of formal closures, which as theorists we've been criticizing in much, much of uh, mainstream history. And this includes uh, what to the avoidance of imposing argumentative closures as well. Uh, sensitive historians don't, don't try to give you the only option of what they're doing. And they do, as she says, they demonstrate this intellectual hesitation. And I think Farge's uh, own work as a historian at the time also demonstrates that, like most uh, what we take to be good historians. So they utilize carefully crafted prose narrative. They take into account multiple perspectives, multiples, multiple interpretations, and they aim to make sense of various themes and, and address questions in uh, Farge's uh, Vanishing Children of Paris, which he wrote with Jacques Revel. And she asked the kind of question, or they asked the kind of questions like, what was uh, behind the influx of people to the city? What created opposition and hostility between the people and police in the, in the sort of uprisings and so on? And there's sort of very specific questions and the discussion is presented in, this, in fairly conventional form, but at the same time, they, they do focus on providing very intricate answers and continually demonstrate that awareness of the challenges that any forming of co coherent sort of closure or very comprehensive accounts um, would, would pose. And I wanted to give a quick quote, oh, quote also from that specific, explicitly historical book. So it's not a reflection on history, it is a history book, Vanishing Children of Paris. And uh, Farge and Ravel at the beginning of that, they, they explain what they're doing. They say, here then is an account of the Paris uprising of 1750. To add to those accounts already in existence, the story can be simplified or embellished with fresh detail at will. This account is honest and verifiable against the sources, yet it is necessarily deceptive since the very nature of such an account introduces an element of order and coherence to the fragmented events of the actual revolt. So again, same emphasis. The research side is perfectly in order. No worries about that. It's verifiable against the sources, whatever they do. But regardless, the, the whatever the presentation is, it's necessarily deceptive. Well, basically, that's language, the way language works, the way representation works. And it seems that a good many historians and theorists can agree on that point. I think so. So this uh, also the divide between theory and and practicing historians that we've had for like fifty decades until very recently. I think seems somewhat unjustified when you actually look at how they present what they're doing or how theorists present the critique or sometimes the analysis of, of what historians do. So really, the main caveat I want to make in that respect is that historians are good at what they do and aware of the theoretical difficulties much of the time and much too often as theorists or philosophers of history, we don't give them credit for that. Um, but Opposed to those kinds of insights that they do present in these histories, I'll, for the rest of um, what I'll be saying, I'll be focusing on alternatives to what they conventionally do with respect to form. But I just wanted to get some of these uh, unnecessary oppositions quickly out of the way as well and, and lay the groundwork for, for how historians are also open, many historians are also open to doing this kind of more alternative history. And also, I wanted to present that aware historical position also just as much, if not more, as a criticism of the limits of, of much of the recent uh, theory debates we've been having as well. So anyway, I want to tackle, in, in the rest of what I do, I want to tackle the idea of alternative histories from three points of view, uh, present them in three ways that can be approached, or present three ways that they can be approached. Um, when trying to theorize them. And in part, these have been debates with separate debates with distinct audiences, but you'll see how they overlap very quickly. The uh, first, first one I wanted to concentrate on, which is no surprise, I'm sure, is this idea of crossing a line between fact and fiction. It seems to have been sort of a, 
hardest part of the debate so the last 50 or well, five sorry five decades or so and at the same time it's not in any way a new phenomenon i think any classicist would quickly remind that Thucydides, for example does that all the time if we look at it it doesn't match anything but we criticize now if if we take the side of the conventional history that we start criticizing it, he wouldn't fit in again back to sandy cohen's idea that history has been going on for 2500 years as a to, as opposed to the idea that history has been done for 200 years, there's a very clear reason for that, because if we start to apply the standards that we tend to apply to, apply to contemporary history, we can't go very far back in time at all. Um, you'll remember there was a time when that question of fact or fiction wasn't relevant at all for what we call history. So in the 16th, 17th centuries, if you look at some of the history, history books from that time, you'll see that we have stories which are considered historical and which would now be considered historical, but then we have stories which are about dragons or giants in that same book presented with the whole, exactly the same, same expectation of credibility and so on. So it's only really with a professionalization of the history in the last 200 years that, that we come to have the kinds of histories which we're now defending as a disciplinary history. And of course that takes us back to White's book, quote in White's point, which I showed you, with the idea that history is currently conceived as a historical accident. So, so when, when I'm presenting this uh, criticism, it's relating to the institution of modern history, which is what we, we're dealing with now with contemporary historians, of course, contemporary academic historians. And, and that, that very narrow compass specific point in time really is where the dividing line between fact and fiction has been instituted as a defining one and that's also, of course, where the possibility to actively res resist it has then also come about because you haven't had the opportunity before. So some of the classic uh, attempts, of course, you know, from Michel Foucault's The Order of Things, he says at the same time that it's a fiction, a novel, and at the same time defends it as, as an academic history. So where you start to have attention. The uh, conversations we've been having, which would be more polemic in the field. I think one good example would be uh, Simon Sharma's dead certainties because mostly because of some of the controversy it raised. So, so dead certainties, you'll all remember that with the subtitle Unwarranted Speculations. So already questioning again as Foucault saying it's both an academic history and both, but it's a fiction or a speculation. Sharma does very much the same. But as you'll remember, he starts out with that imaginary speech of five pages where there's no significant invented facts, but at the same time, it's a speech which never took place, which is presenting as a historical speech. And uh, that really is, I think, what's um, called forth the worst except, uh, of the hardest uh, critique and objections, of which I'll just, I just want to raise Keith Winshuttle's one from The Killing of History, partly because it's so naive, but his response to Shama basically was that history is being murdered by, by uh, these kinds of things, and specifically by this book, Dead Certainties. And Winshuttle, of course, many of you will know, is wrote as his criticism, the claim that once some book, some of a book of history is discovered to be fabricated, the reader can never be sure that it's not all made up. Under these conditions, how could we have any confidence that the composite version itself is at all accurate or authentic? Once the writer admits that some of what he or she has written is fiction, the reader is bound to suspend judgment about the credibility of everything the writer has written. Now, of course, that last meant, last argument is slightly nonsensical. If, if a writer admits, then it would should raise our confidence when they when they claim that some other part is actually sort of more more true to to the facts. So it's a strange reaction, but it got repeated over and over for huge parts of our, our discussion about fact and fiction. Um, and if you go back from this idea of Winshuttle just to Farge and Ravel's clear and moderate formulation of what they do as historians when they say it's necessarily deceptive, what they're doing because of the very nature of writing about fragmented events and, and this kind of thing already begins from the kind of objection presented by Winshuttle so, so strongly here begins to, to dissolve, I think. And that's really the core theoretical insight, of course, from the history fiction debate. And it's 
again, I want to emphasize it's so clear for many practicing, practicing historians as well, but at the same time, extreme critics like Win Winshuttle just never, never seem to, to manage to comprehend that kind of, kind of argument. And of course, Shama is not alone in, in this kind of text, which it was a huge debate theoretically in the 90s. And you had, of course, so many historians also engaging in it all the way from the 60s to, to really the early 2000s at least. And now I think the controversy has died, died down a bit, so you don't see as much of that. But uh, of course, Natalie Davis, uh, there she is, uh, Women on the Margins from 1995 is another good example. And of course, as, as you know, as a historian, Zeman Davis gives a lot of credit to Alette Farge for her work as well. So, so you already see some of these connections forming in the historiographical tradition as well. Um, again, Davis' work was met with very forceful, similar criticism by, by more objective, objectivistly oriented or inclined critics, not necessarily historians, but more, more sort of cultural theorists, perhaps. And in there as well, I want to show you the prologue because it's really only the prologue, which is written as a conversation between fictional historical characters. Well, slightly fictional, but of course, as in Shama's book, the uh, conversation is, is made up and it's really only this prologue. And again, it's based on serious research, what these people would perhaps say if they were in this sort of, if, if there was this opportunity. So she's presenting what confidently can be assumed to be the kinds of views presented by these people or held by these people and then putting them in a generative context where they express them in form which she presents in this way but but again it's based on serious research the objections were more that you can't present history like this and you can't have like there in the middle of the page on the right you'll see Zeman Davis herself intervening so again if, if you're a serious historian you can't make these kinds of transgressions into the form which which is strange because as I said it's, it's all based on good historical research. So why why does that control? Why should that control the form? Why do we need to have that boring, classic, realist form when you can present it, present history in, in different ways? So I, what do I want to say? I think the main thing with these examples that I want to say is that the, the debate about faction our fact fiction sorry, is, is really a discussion about professionalization and control, as, as you saw in, in the theoretical quotes, especially from Sandy Cohen. So it's about authority. So we have discussions about history versus historical novels versus historical film and so on. And, and this, this idea of controlling the future, having authority of what is legitimately expressible and what's not. And, and that's where I think the dis discipline has been eroding. So also perhaps a reason why some of these discussions in relation to para history aren't so keen anymore because history doesn't have that same kind of discipline to control necessarily anymore. Um, so linked to that first option, very closely linked to that first option of uh, crossing the, uh, or maintaining the fact fiction boundary rather, there's this second, uh, way of trying to discuss alternative histories, which very often hinges on this idea of doing justice to the past, which often means doing justice to the spirit of the past, uh, doing justice to people's integrity and so on. So we don't uh, abuse historical actors, as it were, or sometimes also just doing, doing justice to the uh, empirical aspects. Although, as I said, that's very well taken care of in the research side of things for historians. So it's, it's not the most important thing about doing justice, that's more um, about the spirit of integrity. And uh, in sort of conceptualizing these two ways, or conceptualizing this idea of doing justice as, as a way of uh, trying to delimit the scope of acceptable history, there's, there's uh, two ways also within that, I think. One is, uh, on one hand, you have the idea of doing justice by not being too literal. And on the other hand, you have the idea of doing justice by not overindulging in aestheticizing, so not going too far with the form. And I want to address those two very quickly as well. So, so first, the idea of not being over, overly literal 
question then needs to be asked when, in what situations is being literal a problem? And the common arguments are that uh, being too literal, too literal, whatever that would precisely mean is, the one problem is that it's too easy to domesticate that kind of text to make it serve whatever purpose you want, or that kind of history, if it's not a text, whatever presentation or format text. Um, Another common argument is that the events don't receive the recognition they somehow deserve if you're not sort of, if you're only literally presenting events instead of giving them their meaning in that sort of um, sense of doing justice to the, to the spirit, to the meaning of it in, in some also rhetorical sense. And of course we have some histories which, which do try to do that to avoid, um, or to, to be very literal. I almost simply catalog things very closely, but, but more it's a matter for, as, as we know from, from the history of historiography, we, it's, it's more a matter of chronicles and source books and things we now tend to categorize as bad histories where things are just very literally presented. And most of the histories that come to mind do an excellent job in finding a balance between these two these options, of course, for good reason, because, um, the ones that don't find a good balance, they don't reach the classic status to be well known enough and to pick as examples, as opposed to a lot of the examples I've mentioned so far. Um, it's it's hard, as I said, to find examples of, of proper histories, which would be too literal, even though that's an objection in many ways. It's easier to see how that functions when we look at parahistorical debates. So, so sort of other debates to do with representing the past. I hope the, um, I had some trouble finding it. I'm still having some trouble, apparently. There we go. No, it's just me. So, so I think from the parahistorical debates, you'll remember from the 90s again, and then some repetition very recently by James E. Young about monuments and remembrance and memorials and, and different laws relating to that and so on. Um, and the basic argument for Young, of course, was in, in favor of not being too literal, was a, was a very straightforward one in terms of statues and monuments, that if a statue is very realistic, it easily becomes commonplace. If its size and so on is, is very easily appropriable, then again, it very easily becomes commonplace. So, so in a lot of these discussions, what the outcomes were more like the memory park in Buenos Aires. Um, so I'm just going to show this picture very quickly because you'll see the similarity. The uh, Vietnam Memorial, uh, Yad Vashem, but basically it's it's more about it, it's about employing different kinds of strategies. So what we'll be doing is is to focus on size, to focus on experience, on embodiment, something which which let's say speaks to us in, in a different register where you're actually evoking emotions and experience to, to some extent. And uh, there, with these kinds of examples, to me, at least it's much easier to see why being too literal sometimes is, is not enough. And the literality which comes when you just see a presentation of names and so on is very different because it also evokes the scale at least. But, but we can talk about that. I'm, I'm conscious that I'm, I'm going on quite long. I'm sorry about that. So a few things I still want to say. So, so the other option inside that idea of doing justice is to avoid aestheticization too much. And then the question, of course, becomes why, why can or how can aestheticization become a problem? And the common arguments there, of course, are that it distances us too much from the from reality of the, the if, excuse me, the reality of the event. And in, in many ways, that's a parallel to the problem of fictionalization, but it brings the emotional component better to before. But we don't want to get too far into, into some heightened emotion or something that we paralyze ourselves in terms of, of uh, taking the event as real anymore in the same sense. And of course, in this visualization, there are other, other strategies. So one would be to rely too much on a pattern, to have too strong and overarching explanations or critiques against bad histories in that sense are very, very uh, varied, but very much to do with the form as well as, as the 
and the beliefs undergirding that form, let's say. So we can think of Toynbee's A Study of History or Christopher Dawson's Progress and Religion as things where, where the pattern is too strong and there's a reliance on trying to aestheticize in terms of presenting abstractions, which somehow give us the explanation. So, so there's that. Uh, okay, another strategy, let's say, which, which again is something we need to be conscious of when we think about the alternatives. Um, I think there's also some very useful examples I wanted to show. Persepolis by Satrapy as, as a useful example on the side of para history, which depart from proper history. And, and there you can really see, if you look at the examples about how the appeals in, in the comic strip, so I, yeah, I, I think comic strip is the correct word. I always get confused what the, what, what the uh, politically correct word to use is with regard to these. Um, but you'll see how, how the embodiment and everything is coming through, especially on the, on, on the right hand side with the torture example. How, how the appeals can be made very differently again to, to written form, obviously, and also because it's not a written form undergirded by professional limitations and you see the effectiveness is much better. So basically the point I want to make is that the fuss is really all about language and representation, not about the contents itself in, in these alternatives. And then you, when you look at aestheticization or doing justice or any of these ideas, you, there's always good arguments on both sides and especially there's arguments for finding a suitable balance again so so it's, it's a negotiation it's not something that should be prescribed in the way that much of the discussions about what constitutes history are currently being presented as prescriptive okay i i shouldn't go back to the uh, fictionalization i meant to say a few words about that as well let me think for a second. I'll give you a quick, I want to give one quick example because I think that really crystallizes why how the uh, fictionalization, fact fiction uh, and aestheticization thing can be tackled. It's, the, uh, it's this idea of, well, timely now from Ukraine, but this was already four or five years ago at least when they converted the Lenin statue to Darth Vader. So it's a perfect metaphor, I think, or example of historical representation to understand how metaphorical representation also works. So repurposing the past in, in these ways is not certainly a, a phenomenon for history and historians alone, but you can see here, I think, really well how a trope functions. It's an imposition of meaning, imposition of a trope. There's an explanation which is imposed onto that content, onto the way things are. So that, I really like this because it gives a very good um, illustration of how how also linguistic representation typically works. And it, it's obviously different from saying Lenin was like Vader using a metaphor like that. But it shows how that repurposing also happens in language all the time. And it demonstrates how complex constructions also are put together in these kinds of examples of meaning making. But on top of that, there's this quality which para history has better that the physicality, physicality also creates some differences and there's appeals to, to our experience in a different way, in a different register than we would have in language. Um, sadly, all the discussions about affect and so on haven't, haven't really made their way into, into the theory of history debates yet, or even some of the old discussions about metaphor and the way language functions haven't really made their way properly into our debate. Um, okay. Um, what I want to still say, a few more things. Um, the first two approaches I mentioned, this idea of uh, focusing on fact and fiction, or on focusing on doing justice in saying how we should do history there, what makes them the, this, the alternative aspects of those discussions come about largely in the way they deal with the relation of representation to reality. And so they're limited in, in the way they function, the strategy they employ, and they're in, inadequate approaches for two very important reasons, which I already hinted on, I think, in that. So they tend to be prescriptive 
And, and the reason why being prescriptive is a weak strategy was already mentioned when I mentioned that we have innovations and then quite quickly they become outdated and that makes them very vulnerable, whatever strategy we, whatever specific strategy we pick to, to do one of these things, to create alternatives by playing around with fact or fiction or by playing around with how we, we do justice to the past. It makes them vulnerable to being invalidated very quickly by the change in the discourse, the change in reading sensibilities and so on. And, and the other reason of a problem with them is that they focus very much on the relation. Um, um, because they focus so much on the relation of the representation to what is real, they engage with the problem of conventional representations on epistemological grounds only, and they limit themselves. So, so they are always about how well, how effectively, how accurately, how realistically we represent the past. And then the discussion always also returns to that rather than to that presentist component of why are we actually doing this? And the reason why it's, it's also a weak strategy to work with the epistemological in that way is that it leads us to think that the problem is really about the problem with history of how to think about history is indeed about truth in the sense of precise factual information. And then it, it just stops our discussion at the level where we think that if we're just going to, if we just manage to get things right, we don't need to worry about the ethical and the political consequences of what historians are doing and so on. And then despite those kinds of weaknesses, much of the theory debate has, has centered on that, on these simple issues with an emphasis on the epistemological. And at the same time, we've had this, this 50 years that we've been having those debates, we've never have been parallel very sophisticated, very intense debates, which, which somehow aren't in, they're not, they're not constituting the sort of ground from which we're having our current discussions, which I find worrying. Um, there's also a third option. I said, I'm gonna mention three options. So the third one is this idea of finding new experimental forms. And of course it can combine the, with these first two ideas. It obviously very easily involves fact fiction transgressions, as we said, history is always deceptive in that sense to some extent. But, but the reason why I make, present it as a separate point is that the core of experimentation is elsewhere. And that core is exactly there to make history relevant because history can offer brilliant insights as long as it's not domesticated to that sort of disciplinary agenda if we accept that kind of very radical view. And, and if it can manage to speak to audiences in a way that's accessible and appealing then it can become relevant in, in our social and cultural debates as well. Um, yeah, so, so I guess the reason that I'm arguing we get rid of that epistemological focus and get rid of a fact, fact fiction debate or we'll sideline it and move, let's say, move, move, move from it, move on is that it really prevents us from thinking about the purpose of history. And if we go back to Nietzsche, it was for life, as, as I said. So the real challenge, I think, instead is, and this is something Hayden White uh, already suggests in the burden of history, is that we, as historians, what we need to do is really try and keep up with the changing sensibilities. And uh, of course, we have good examples of that as well in, in these already existing experimental histories. Um, let me see, I'm going to have to. Sorry about that. I am going to quickly mention a few. There's uh, Hans Ulrich Gumbres in 1926, which is, of course, an easy one. This was also in the 90s, 1997. It's an easy one to reference because most people have already experienced it that way, I think. And uh, for those who don't know it, of course, Gumbreth's strategy is to make these short chapters, which are, even though it's in book form, he's presenting them in a way as a hypertext. So you'll see these bold, bold, bold and keywords there. And then when you come across one, you're expected just to skip to a different part of a book and create your own reading experience and it works fairly well 
if one is if one is active to give that sort of general idea of that year 1926 because he's picking on many of the very very typical themes and describing them well there's another example i wanted to quickly show if no it's not i'm doing something wrong i'm not getting there how do i no uh oh okay no <laughs> sorry for that um here i wanted to just mention jim goodman's blackout which i think is 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 just the story the history of one night but uh in new york when the electricity went Ah, no, this is annoying. I've lost the thread in the presentation. So basically you can look at the uh, form again, when the electricity goes out, he just describes people having pizza, sitting on the sidewalk, doing this. And it's, it's all presented in that tone as well, as you see on the left. Some talked, some walked, some waited for buses. On the right, the second paragraph, people ate on the late side. And he just mentions sort of lists things and, and it's very, nice literary presentation of what happened. And uh, there's still, despite this form, there's still, again, well-researched content, con content. There's still a very clear lesson in a way. The idea is that people didn't loot, they didn't riot. There's solidarity. It just shows people going on with their lives. And uh, it's especially in relation to these kinds of presentations where I think much of the criticisms of narrativism that we've had recently go wrong because it's not enough to break with realism then to suddenly get rid of all implotments and moral lessons to stories and so on is still, they're always present also in narratives of this more complex kind. I wanted to look a little bit at the things that these kinds of representations achieve as well, but I'll, I'm just gonna list them very, very quickly, I think to, to make a point. So they, they create some sense of fragmentarity of reality, not just of the presentation, to varying extents, of course, but they, they sort of, in a way, they can be thought to bring us closer to our daily experience of reality because of the way they do that. Because of a fragmentation leaving meaning making to us, they can also make us more aware of the imposition of meaning because that responsibility shifts more to us than it does to the text. They often give easier access to the people involved, so we might identify more, we might empathize more. And again, as with, with the other kinds of power history, um, this is an official history, so but comparing it to power histories of novels or memorials or whatever, they also create a feeling. There's an emotional connection to the story and so on. And there's that already that uh, emerging immersiveness, which of course becomes much stronger in, in different forms. And of course, you can see the tension in the goals there as well, because there's at the one side, there's fragmentarity. At the other side, there's this idea of immersiveness. But, but uh, and, and that's essentially the same problem as we had with the tension between being literal and, and aestheticizing too much, but, but they do kind of work out because the responsibility for the meaning making is on, on the reader or the viewer. So they have to bring that meaning and, and bring those fragmentation and immersiveness together in that experience. Um, Conventionally, in the traditional book of history in a written text, that's a hard tension to, to overcome because the reading experience demands a lot of work as opposed to a physical experience in space or the experience of viewing a film because you're, you need to be interested to, to actually make sense. And I think some good examples there would be Natalie Zeman Davis' fiction in the archives, um, typical one where she avoids any intervention and just almost like a source book, just lets things uh, present, well, let's the text present themselves. Same with, uh, sorry, no, order is lost here. The same with, uh, again, Arlette Farge and uh, Michel Foucault's experiments of uh, disorderly families from the 80s, where it's almost like a source book. There's very little intervention. And of course, Foucault famously has, famously has some of it of a text like that already very early on, which, which I've been doing the same things. So there's this approach to experimentation already 
sort of going back in actual historical writing quite a long time that we've been discussing in theory also in parallel with that. And uh, that has really been the upshot of debates on the linguistic term on narrativism or narrative theory of history. But I think uh, expectedly there's a rupture also in the way we deal with the past now. So it's following on from that discussion. Um, the limits that we, we set on history as, as being professional history um, have led us to this discussion of experimentation to an extent, but more now in this specific historical situation, the way we read, read histories and the, the sort of importance that we ascribe to para histories. I think that's where the limits really of history really come in. So as a counter to To both these, in a way, failed experiments on the history side, the way history hasn't really adapted enough to read our sensibilities as well as our theoretical discussions. There's, there's now we've come back more in our discussions to questions of historicity or memory and so on. And there's been very little attempt in my experience to see how these, these really fit together. And instead of trying to see what happens on that para history side, in relation to experimentation, experimentation in, in, let's say, I'll say academic history to be as little controversial as possible. Instead of that, people just pretty much have forgotten the debate about historical representation before, I think, um, really having engaged with it enough. Um, and focus is now increasingly on dealing with the past in, in that para history aspect, so on memory, on heritage public history, museums, history sites, reenactment, monuments, and of course, for more traditional films, TV, literature, um, comic strips, also family histories, that, that whole sort of broad para history. And I think the theoretical things we're doing are, are not really in discussion with that anymore, or well, currently at least. Mm. Let me just think about the final things I want to say. I'm sorry, I've gone on so long. Um, there's some things to me that change in, in interests has suggests, and one is that we might have run out of successful alternative forms for historians to utilize. I don't know if that's the case or not, or, or if it's just not that the debate hasn't uh, offered enough motivation for historians or the disciplinary structure or something doesn't offer enough motivation, or if it's just that there simply isn't, is no longer enough common ground for historians and audiences to connect, that might be one possibility. But, but somehow history, as opposed to para history, is not making itself relevant in the same, same ways as, as history was when it was more dominant. And that's, I think, the really a very important thing about all this is that if the intention is from the side of historians, both to make history interesting and to avoid the normalizing and subjugating effects of historical representation, as the critics would say, then what we need is a working agreement between historians and the audiences about what's acceptable and what the purpose of particular representations are, not an agreement or a disciplinary sort of understanding, which only comes from the academic side. And especially important, I think, is that with respect to history as an academic pursuit, that agreement has gradually at least, if it hasn't always been unclear, it's become unclear. And there's some lack of shared understanding, which I think is historians' responsibility and theorists and philosophers of history responsibility to, to somehow try, try and uh, rectify. I had a few things that I wanted to show, but I guess I should conclude and just say, I think the upshot of what, what I had or what I will do when I manage to write that introduction as well is, is to argue for toward ways why history or how history and why, well, first why, which I tried to give you, and then how history might continue to be relevant. And uh, in a way, it's a summary of what I've just said. So basically, as historians, the questions we need to ask would have to change in that same direction of audience sensibility. So forget about strict debates about fact and fiction, forget about strict debates about epistemology, Forget about these debates we've been having about modernism or postmodernism or other models. And instead, just focus, take seriously this idea of experimentation and focus on the fact that sensibilities 
have really changed and we need to look beyond the kinds of issues of content and form we've traditionally been arguing with and focus on the idea of communication and, and ask what this, this function of communication introduces to the equation, which we really haven't discussed yet. And, and maybe see things as conceived of in more dynamic ways where experimentation becomes feasible, fe feasible as part of a communication. And I think for now, for, for, for the time being still, becoming current with contemporary reading sensibilities could still mean these already quite old ideas of confusion, polyphony, explosion of representational entities, but it could also, I think, more successfully somehow turn more towards questions of embodiment, playing up similarities in terms of phenomenological structures, using embodied metaphors, all these ideas of immersion, which have strongly emerged in other fields already, but we still haven't really tackled very much. Uh, maybe the idea of shared experientiality or something like this across experience, I still think we should be quite quite careful of. But but there's a lot of things if we sort of gave that narrow disciplinary definition only the space it deserves and looked beyond the idea of that, that kind of history and, and took some cues from power history the way sort of talking about the past functions as a communication between experts and, and audiences now. I think there's a lot more that could be done still instead of just saying, okay, let's forget about, about history. Um, and at the same time, as a, as a point, the final point I'm gonna make, which I want to make, which Robert Rosenstone makes in one of his books about experimental history, which is that as historians, the disciplinary limits that I've discussed are serious and there's also the drawback that as Rosenstone puts it to do anything else would pretty much be career suicide so there's no no um, enticement for historians to actually go in that direction so in that sense maybe maybe all this push to actually do something different is is undue and uh, not realistic but maybe there will be some of us who will be happy to do career suicide instead of just repeating what previous generations have done Okay, that's it. And uh, hopefully we can discuss, I'm sorry, I took us slightly longer than I intended. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Carla. Okay, now it's the time for questions, concerns, comments, contrasts, whatever you feel like. Um, is there immediately any, let me check the chat, any questions? Was there something? Um, is there anyone? Ask well, me. was there someone? I didn't see anyone. I mean, I thought there was some. Oh, sorry. Oh, they had the hands up. I'm not sure if it was a clapping or hands. Sultan or um, I, I with clapping. Do you have a Do you have a question or was it a clapping? I, I was actually I was actually clapping, but, but okay. I have but I have a very naive question to 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 break the ice. Although I mean, this is this is incredibly rich and uh, but that's not like my field of expertise so I apologize in advance for if, if the question is not uh, um, particularly insightful but I was but I was interested as a, as a, as a general um, how can I say outlook on the topic and understanding exactly I mean uh, if I if I understood it correctly, I mean the concept of, of parahistory uh, can redefine uh, the boundaries of history itself as, as, as a discipline, but, I, but, I, but I'm curious to understand what are the boundaries of para-history itself. I mean, if there is anything that, I mean, uh, uh, although based on or probably bearing some historical insights cannot in any case count as para-history or be beneficial in any case about a, 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 as far as a debate on the historical methodology it is concerned. I, I, I can't make some examples, but let's say I mean, you, you, were, you were talking about like uh, fictionalizing history, but, but to which extent I mean history-based fiction can be, can be, can be considered a, a form of, a form of parahistory. A couple of examples like, like a, a movie, like, like uh, Kubrick's Barry Lyndon, or else there is um, a certain Irving Yalom that writes like um, 
historical, philosophical informed novels he, he wrote uh, when Nietzsche's uh, when Nietzsche wept or uh, something like that, the, the Spinoza problem or something like that. So you read these kind of things and, and, and they actually are very good at, at providing you like, like uh, insights or a kind of an, uh, yeah, an outlook of how things used to work back in the day. So you, you, you get to learn something about uh, Amsterdam in the 17th century uh, by, by by reading a uh, Yalom uh, novel about, about Spinoza. You, you, you get to learn, I mean, uh, how, something about at least costumes or, or, or I mean, uh, uh, how, how Europe during the Seven Years' War uh, used to be by, by looking at Berlino. Yet there is nothing in those novels and nothing in those movies that you cannot find by reading like history books. I mean, they made their research in order to do the fiction. So everything that is in those fiction is fictional, but for the non-historian, it is in any case to some extent a bridge towards a kind of learning about the, but about how things could go. But there is no real fact uh, shown by them. And of course, I mean, me as a historian of philosophy, I would never dare citing like a Yalom uh, novel about, about Spinoza. Although I would happily read it, and I mean I can use it in any, in any case to have a clearer understanding of how people used to hang about in those days. So, okay, sorry for being so long, but this is more or less my, my kind of doubt. I mean, can can we draw a line uh, about what what counts as para history? Uh, so, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was very very helpful. Thank you. Um, that's very much my concern what I'm trying to address all of these questions. So um, I, my interest is really, as I said, I don't want to be too strongly, but just present that as a division in any broader history culture, any, any sort of broad debate about the past. So the way we relate to the past in representations and then show how we can divide that into a fairly insular, from its own point of view, a fairly insular discipline and then all these other very rich forms and, and my interest really is is on that not not on the definition but on what happens when we come close to the boundary from both sides and exactly your your examples are, are examples where we're sort of negotiating that boundary and and i think the uh, then the further question for me is is what's important when we come to that boundary and, and at least in thinking about this now, the important thing really isn't the factual bit of a question of fact and fiction, because even though you say you wouldn't reference uh, historical fiction in your own work, it, it doesn't mean, which I think you also said, it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be facts in that work. It's just that those facts aren't documented. They're not, you can't use them as evidence, but those facts are still that sort of support, which is why they actually will tell you something real and, and brought about the past. But for me, that, that sort of uh, overlapping of facts is not the most interesting question. For, for me, the most interesting question really is how much can we take of these different strategies that are used in that sort of richness and diversity of the kinds of para histories we have, and how much of that can we import into disciplinary history and if there are objections, what are those objections based on? Because most of that won't interfere with any of the research, with any of the facts as presented and so on. So then the question is, why does the discipline object to all these different kinds of strategies and how legitimate those objections would be to something simply because it's not the way we've, we're used to doing history as historians. But at the same time, it doesn't really change any of the basic requirements we impose on history when we define what it is, how it should be responsible science and so on. And, and just that, how much we can push for envelope of the presentational form and how justifiably historians might be able to resist that or reject that or argue against it and so on. So, so, so my interest would be in, in looking at these sort of non-traditional components in para history as, as opposed to disciplinary history and then seeing seeing that boundary and that liminal space, defining it in terms of why those are acceptable and why they aren't acceptable. Mm 
on both sides of the boundary. But with facts, you don't have that problem because facts can easily move across that boundary, apart from the way that they can't be used in evidence, as you said, if they come from popular history. Okay, thank you. Um, Sultan raised his hand now. Um, I have one question to Sultan. I have so I have a point on this issue exactly. If it's if yours is also on this, I'll let you go first. Otherwise, I would ask if I could first ask. Okay, well, I have a question on this. Sorry, what is um on the question of uh, para histories and uh, maybe differentiation? You said that historians are very good in what they are doing. You gave them credit for the when you talked about Alet Farish, I think. Um, and then you gave the example of, also of Natalie Simon Davis of a book about maybe of 17th century women. And there you said she only has a small part of that book, which is fictional. This is the beginning, the, the, this dialogue, where she also interjects herself. And then you also said there, this, this is very well based on research as well, so on the evidence. So it could have happened in the 17th century like that, this dialogue. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, maybe I could finish the question first. Um, so aren't you yourself um, using the epistemological standards or the, the epistemological questions to, sort of to justify that fictional part of it? So in, in, in that sense, it's still, um, that in that sense, we can talk about it as um, true enough or whatever. We can talk about it as it, it could have happened. I mean, this needs to be fleshed out philosophically what that exactly means and how that works. But then and if the rest of the book is also proper or traditional historiography, then it is very clear that sort of the para-historical stuff or whatever it is gets its force by the traditional historical stuff, right? So in that sense, um, it's still the epistemological um, criteria that called the shots here, if I, if I understand it correctly, if, if I understood your example correctly. Um, so I, I guess the, the question is not so much on that work, can we, can we admit fictional elements into it? But then is the relation to the actual evidence and to the epistemological work that historians do still close enough? Is it justifiable? We need to classify what it is. And there might be some difference in it, but at least it is there, right? I mean, the Simon Davis dialogue was not so outlandish that it wouldn't have been served the purpose of uh, teaching potential readers about the past. And it might have been very, very successful in that sense, because it was a prototypical dialogue as science also full of idealizations and that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. That would be my question. So I guess the, 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 the basic question is, doesn't still the epistemological criteria call the shots? And they are the most important, maybe not the most important, but at least in your example, they are the, the, the stuff that really does the work to make yeah. these fictional parts actually interesting <laughs> and serve yeah. the purpose, at least of being about the past. Maybe it's other purpose. Maybe it's great as an entertainment, and maybe some people read it for that. Great. That there might be a different purpose. There might have different criteria. We can talk about that too in another time or differently. But that would be my question. Let me try. I, I said, I, I presented. I I see now the uh, Simon Davis prologue. Uh, I misrepresented that, or I, I presented it in a confusing way because when I say the things that, or what I what I tried to say, I can't remember what I said. What I tried to say was that the thing, the opinions these people present, they are on a research basis. They could probably be the kinds of opinions they would present if they were in that situation. But of course, these are women who are in different continents at slightly differing times, so that situation is not possible. So get that out of the way first. Of course, that would never have been possible. Also, Zeman Davis in joining into that conversation would never have been possible. So in that sense, it's not, not uh, an epistemological criterion to judge things by at all. Um, so, so it was more about uh, what Aristotle talks about in, in the rhetorics as, as believability or probability. This is my comment related to that, not to be epistemological as such. So the presentation doesn't really say anything which would mislead us in terms of opinion, but only that fictional setting which he creates to present those opinions, to have that, that sort of exchange. Uh, but but I think this goes back to what but my, my answer to your broader question goes back to what I, I was saying to Alberto as well, that. Uh, the epistemological isn't interesting in the sense that it can't define most of what else happens. So, so all these interesting things that you can do in presentation, they're not reducible to the epistemological. The epistemological has very little hold on whether they're permissible or not. So, so getting the facts right is basically that's, that's the ground level to talk about the past in any representation. If, if you want it to be about the past, then that's that's already. So so I, I can't see how epistemology could be in any way determining beyond that very basic uh, 
thing that historians are expected to do. And, and then everything, my problem again is that everything they do on top of that, for some reason, the discipline objects to that, even though it doesn't really alter any of those basic requirements. It doesn't say that they're doing them wrong. It just says, okay, you're doing something which you shouldn't do as a historian, even though you're doing everything a historian should be doing. And then some. So, so it's, it's more this, this very conventional objection that historians can only do certain things in their presentation. But, but for me, the epistemological doesn't really factor. I, I can't say it directly in response to the way you formulated it because I'm having trouble wrapping my head around the formulation where epistemology would be so determining. But, oh, but I hope I, I might, we touch on what you might, might have been my failing com in communicating. Maybe I don't fully understand myself what, what, is, what the point is, but okay. Um, then we have Sultan and the only I think Sultan was first, so please. Yes, thank you. And this time I uh, really raised my hand previously. I was just clapping. Um, I also have a similar question, or at least, well, not a similar question, but on a topic that also uh, um, Georg was touching upon, and it's the relation between history and parahistory. And I find it's very uh, telling as well that the way that Georg, you also phrase it in a way that parahistory uh, gets powered by history or something like this. Or, and But I mean, is this really the case? And then the, the entire definition of parahistory is, it hinges upon a definition of history or not the definition, but the relationship, right? So you sort of call something parahistory by virtue of relating it to history. So history here is the big player. And I my question would be that, is this really the case? And then uh, it's, if, if uh, um, also in the presentation, you mostly actually focused on, of course, disciplinary history and historical writing, and much less on what's outside history and historical writing. And it's, uh, to my mind, uh, and you also sort of assumed that the problems and the questions that pop up in studying parahistory will be the same as were the questions that popped up in the last decades in studying history, disciplinary history, like the questions clustering around representation. Why would, do we assume that these are actually the problems of parahistory as well? Why do we assume if, if, if you think that there is a history culture within which history as historical writing is only one instance, why is this a sort of a master instance relative to which we measure all other instances of, uh, of a history culture? So mm, my question is really whether can we, I mean, probably it's also due to the fact, of course, that we are you know, in the scholarly context, right? So we are, of course, talking to other scholars, we are talking to historians and so on. So of course, those concerns somehow inform our discussions as well. But, but if we seriously want to study these parahistorical things and how they relate to history, then should we keep on assuming that whatever is parahistory is somehow gains its legitimacy or not legitimacy, but whatever, the way we think about it is as relative to history as historical writing. That was again a very rich question and I'm, I'm having trouble focusing, but I'll, I'll pick on some points and you can remind me about the others. Um, okay, so, so I don't make, in my own thinking, I don't make this, uh, this uh, assumption that history is somehow dominant. I mean, I take para, it comes from Greek, I take it in, you could also use the Latin version co-history, I think. And if you think of that, then history is to para history is co-history or to what I've called para-history, then academic history would be para-history to that. So I don't see a hierarchy there in terms of language at all. And I certainly didn't mean to suggest that. Um, it is just a way of, of making that division within a broader sort of history culture or whatever culture of talking about the past, as we say. And uh, I completely agree with you. I think that's an important point that we can't think of things like memory or or something like that as depending on history, because most often it's the other way around, if anything. 
So, so a lot of the memory culture we have and stuff that has very little to do with, with academic history, sometimes it goes completely in opposite directions, the influence as well. So, so I certainly would think that we should look, have to look at all of these different aspects, different components of histor history culture on their own, judge them on, on their own. And we have disciplines for doing that, but I'm interested in the discipline of history. So then from speaking about the discipline of history in relation to these others, it's much easier to define history as a separate one. And then we could also talk about, I, I don't know, remembrance and para-remembrances if we wanted to define the fields we're negotiating in another way. And we'd have the same discussion. So there's no, no prioritization intended to and, and I do feel the influence is, is more and more from para histories to our general historical understanding than it is from history to our any general historical understanding. So the point I really want to make is that history is being marginalized because it doesn't speak to what people need. Or it doesn't speak at least in terms of those sensibilities that people have. So, so again, that's why I wanted to look at all the other options and what history could learn from those in terms of actually being timely and communicating to the audience. But, but you had so many parts to your question, I'm sure I missed several at least. Oh, yes, and now I have much more uh, after you also answered. So it's, uh, but I think you only want those ones. Yes, we can come back to it maybe after you only want this question, if you're still, if, if they're still pressing the issues. Yes, you only want it, please. Yes, thank you, Kalle. Um, I find it very interesting and very, very promising approach and the idea of uh, experimental forms of um, presenting history. Um, what I wanted to, this is deals with a kind of border, bordering criteriology question. And you started with uh, the phrase, what counts as history? So I was immediately thinking, what counts as what? So what is history? And because history is, is ambiguous as a term, so I had to a little bit think about it. So obviously it's not events, uh, but it's not neither, I suppose it's not writing of history because explicitly you talk about comics and other forms and uh, maybe movies, uh, other forms of un unconventional presentation. So that, that, that's how I get it, maybe they will come. So then I came to the conclusion that it's something like a sanctioned, presentation of the past. Um, and then later or much later on, you actually use the phrase legitimately expressible, which I think it's a good way to put it if, if that's right. So you're interested perhaps in, in what, what is legitimately expressible about the past. And um, when I follow this train of thinking, uh, I come to the conclusion that, yes, it's a good question, but then obviously not everything. Uh, maybe you're saying that more is more should be than has been, but it can possibly be that everything is done. We can easily figure out things or products about the past of films or whatever, which I don't, well, you can take it in, all, all of that. And then that raises, the, I guess, the crucial question. Um, if you ask negatively, what does not count acceptable? What, what, what should not count as history uh, or legitimately expressing about the past. And I'm interested in that order um, because it raises the very issue of uh, normativity and norms. So what kind of criteria should guide us deciding in what counts in, what counts, what goes out and um, the final, what I'm coming here is now, you say that it should not be merely about facts or factually, maybe that's a presumption, I agree. There should be something more, but the interesting thing really is what are those uh, norms and normativity that guides this practice that leads to acceptance or non-acceptance. Um, so briefly, and I think it has to be prescriptive somehow, and whether it's, it's, it's political or, or moral or something, then that's just another form of uh, prescriptivity. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, what is, what is not, and what are the criteria to, to find something acceptable? Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think you, you got me right in that first 
when when I'm speaking about history, I am speaking about disciplinary or academic history, and I try to make that clear. Mm. And the question of legitimation obviously comes in. So, um, but for legitimation, I can't see it as being prescriptive in terms of how to do history, in terms of content or form, because they keep shifting, which to me rules out any any prescriptive model as such. And it would have what we'd have to say is that it's a bit social. It's a social endeavor, and we continuously, as historians, we sort of negotiate what counts as history and what not, and it's mm -hmm. always up to social evaluation. It's not, it can't be prescriptive as such, apart from the institution always pronouncing on individual cases. So that would be my, my sort of quick answer to that. Um, is, I, I can't see any prescriptive. I mean, what we count now as history, I mentioned Thucydides, for example, some people would count it as history by contemporary standards, some people wouldn't. But in the sort of history of historiography, most people would say, as they say, he's the father of history. But uh, if you look at it by contemporary standards, if, some, if one wrote a history today like that, it certainly wouldn't count as an academic history. When you think of uh, the uh, Archidamian War, the last five years are missing. It's paratactic for the first five years, there's no commentary, and then the style completely changes. And if you wrote something like that these days, you, 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 know, you wouldn't count as a historian, certainly. Mm. And, and the same with the examples from the 16th and 17th century, if you look at these geog geography history books, where you have these dragons wandering around and, and stories about giants and stuff, and it's all on par with, with the real historical stories. Again, they, they, today they wouldn't be acceptable. So, so I think it's a constantly negotiated disciplinarily negotiated question what counts and what doesn't count as history mm. and that's why there's so much controversy of course when these experiments come along can i have a brief well, so brief on. brief yes maybe there's there's obiato has raised his hand again maybe sultan but they all have um, very brief because spoken I, before so please yes go ahead i just want to say that i agree that it i mean it sounds possible that it's a social negotiation um and if the, if the outcome of social negotiation or the nature of social negotiation is different from times, then it comes against having a historical, a temporal criteria. I think that's plausible, probably. But then if even if it's a social negotiation, then if we end up with something that something is legitimate and something is not, then it must be guided, must be presuming some even time bound criteria so you had these comics of the, the the person who was split up and there was a, perhaps some moral story of course it could be told in some other way that you got a deserving punishment but you know someone might say well that's not that's not acceptable and then we are guided by some some norms what what is what is not but, yeah yeah uh, i i think i get what you're saying but then we have to distinguish between <laughs> historical norms and moral norms and so on and, and history doesn't prescribe in terms of as a discipline it wouldn't describe in terms of what's permissible to what opinion permissible to present again that's that's something which comes from from the outside in a way mm, yeah but then you have to start defining different kinds of norms and, and expectations and so on as well to to get get to these kinds of moral moral evaluations or to be able to include those mm. i think it becomes much more complicated but I remember part of Zoltan's question, if I may come back to that as well. Zoltan just said, noted, it wasn't a question as much as a point. You noted that I didn't speak so much about the alternatives. That's because I was getting very conscious about time and I had had a ton of sort of other representations to look at, including the Lenin statues. There's a really, really exciting project, which was done in 2018, 2019, just documenting what was done in Ukraine to the Lenin statues and, and stuff like So there was a lot of parahistory examples that I wanted to get into. But but, uh, next time. Okay. Um, the, Obiato, you raised your hand again, right? Do you have you have a question, I suppose? Or another question? I, it, it was just a very quick. Uh, yeah, please. Quick, there's, there's nobody quick, else for the moment, as far as I can see. So please. Quick, quick point. But uh, I, 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 I was surprised when when you touched upon like facilities. I mean, because that that was exactly my um like my, my curiosity. I mean, uh, in in um, this, to some extent, uh, um, how can I say, 
Uh, and I, this 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 relationship between uh, history and prehistory, um, as far as uh, as the, as this self appreciation of of of, of historians is, is concerned, no, insofar as it allows like us to better understand what what we are onto and and uh, and what are the boundaries of, of the discipline. The, is it is it merely limited like to to, to, to contemporary effort or, or is there also a, 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 like a, a, um, an appreciation of, of of the past like i mean you, you were saying like for some of the actual historians like uh, yes to say that this is the father of history but it was not really an historian by contemporary standards w would that speak to us nevertheless would would, would in your uh, in the account that you're providing would that Count as a form of parahistory, capable to some extent to put more more, more wood in, 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 in this in this kind of uh, uh, stove, or or, or uh, is it a purely uh, contemporary situated mechanism? The the, 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 the the dialogue between history and parahistory. Thank you. Uh, I, I certainly think it's a very useful example because a lot of the strategies for CDDs uses are strategies which we've been trying again in the 90s, especially in these experimental things. So as, as they're pretty much doing the same thing. So I, I think it's it's definitely useful to go back to these. Another good example which Hayden White gives often is that uh, a lot of what we call the classics of history now, we wouldn't accept as reliable interpretations or the ones I mentioned like Toynbee or Dawson uh, they're so overtly ideological and forcing things into patterns that we wouldn't accept those as as proper academic history today. But at the same time, we have much to learn also from speculative, more speculative philosophies or presentations of history and so on. So there's a lot to learn about the specific ways we can talk about the past and the different mechanisms, different strategies we use. So I think that's all. It, 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 it would all inform the discussion very much in the same way as any kind of para history, I think. And, and in a way, it's much more useful because it's, it is much closer and it's guided by similar aspirations, at least, if not similar commitments. So, so in a way, it helps us see that boundary even, even more clearly because at least the intentions have been more similar than they are in public commemorations or, or you know, different things like that. So. So very, very useful indeed, I think, to look up uh, these alternatives also in, in time or in the tradition, whether they, I, I think it's not really important whether we see them as history or para history because they still give us access to the same kind of strategies and the same kind of debate. So, so that boundary again there is not important in, in the historical sense, but only in the sense of, of what we now would place where in relation to that boundary, I think. Oh, that's at least that's where my interest is. Okay, great. We have another question by um, Zhang Zucheng. Yes, thank please. you, Sun. Thank you, uh, dear colleague. Uh, I I I, th I think uh, what you uh, what you talk about is about one crucial question uh, in history. Uh, it, it is this question is what is history, or how do we we think about history, or how do we research history in contemporary times? Uh, so, uh, my, my my interest about your uh, lecture is, uh, you just said, uh, your interest is uh, lies. Uh, your interest, your main interest, lies in cross boundaries. Cross the boundaries. I, I think it's a very uh, uh, insightful. Uh, point. Uh, um, my question is, uh, how do you define the cross boundaries? Maybe, in my opinion, the cross the boundaries may be uh, between different uh, disciplines. Uh, for example, uh, between history and uh, and aesthetic, or history and uh, uh, philosophy, or maybe uh, cross cross the pond boundaries may be defined as uh, different theoretical modes, such as uh, hidden white modes of uh, as postmodern philosophy or history, or as uh, or as Augusta Kunt, the positivist philosophy or history. 
my question is, uh, can you tell me how do you define the cross boundaries? I think this question is related to your uh, to, uh, to your one crucial term. Uh, it, it is about uh, uh, para history. Uh, sorry, my spoken English is not very good. I don't know. Uh, can you understand me? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was very clear. Um, I mean, it's a difficult question. So I, I started out by talking about the journal rethinking history, because that's where I think a lot of uh, these transgressive things have been done, like the example with the cartoon strip. And I, for me, at least, um, it's very hard even to see the boundaries until someone transgresses them. And then the historian's community is outraged. So like with the example also with Simon Schammer's dead certainties, the outrage that it provoked in people like Keith Winshuttle. I think this is what helps us see the boundary because as long as we're all operating inside what's accepted as a discipline, then the boundaries don't have any significance. And then when someone does something which transgresses, then we have to reevaluate ourselves as a community of historians and to decide whether that thing is acceptable or not. And of course we have differing opinions. We have different communities inside history as well. But, but for me, the, the definition of boundaries, again, I wouldn't be, I, I would not want to try and prescribe anything to say this is a clear boundary because I think it's always to be decided by the disciplinary community in that situation. So, of course, um, I mean, we could, conceivably, we could define certain boundaries, like say, okay, it can't be abstract as in an abstract sculpture to be history or something like that. We, I mean, we could define some, some boundaries too, that it has to be, a, even we could say it has to be a linguistic representation if we want to exclude films and, and other things like this from ac academic history. But at the same time, that seems to be at least becoming very hard because you're already seeing, especially in art departments, people doing academic histories on video, for example, and that's become accepted. So, so I wouldn't like to place any firm boundaries, I think, myself, at least, because I think it's a continuing negotiation. That's it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you also for your question. Um, okay, we are slightly advanced in time, but it's great. Um, is there any more questions, concerns, comments for Carla? Or how are you doing, Carly? I would I would have one more question. I would have a few questions, but I would like to ask ask, ask one more if you are right into it. Sure. Carla. Um, yes. Um, so let me get back to it. Um, it, it was about that you were you were emphasizing very strongly presentist concerns and that you're not alone in that um, because important stuff is ethics politics and how do we how do we go from here the future not the past if you like in some sense um, so and then one question is also that came up in the um, quote of Sandy Cohen um, why are we actually doing it history historiography and my question here is always that of who is the we here? There's not just a polemical question. So I, I really, I really sometimes, I really sometimes wonder who is the we here because obviously historians have very different motivations for doing historiography. Some of them might be just benign or antiquarian; they want to know about the past, good enough. And, and then also readers have a lot of different sort of uh, motivations to read historiography. Some of them might very well be I want to have a realist representation of the past and know what happened, how limited or however limited that is. And that points me to the other question. Um, but that, that that comes up with that um, about the we um, you claim and you have claimed it before. Um, how 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 can history historiography reclaim a certain position that it has lost relevance, um, a new uh, like reader author pact or readership, however however we call that. Um, but what kind of indications, if you like, what kind of evidence do we have that this sort of that this reader ship packed or that the that, 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 that sensibilities as you also said they have actually changed in the readers that they sort of want something different of course we have immersion nowadays and we have a lot of other stuff we have digitality and that gives 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 new forms yes and it and everybody's trying something out and it's experimental and that's great but maybe i'm just harping on the same point always i think we know too little about that we need a, we need we need, we, need, we need a sociology of both of historians what they actually think and who they are and of readership of what they think and who they are so I'm not saying that your claim is necessarily wrong. I'm just, I just don't know. Maybe, maybe it's epistemic. For me, it's epistemically underdetermined. I wouldn't know how to answer it. I think we know too little, or maybe you know better. So give me some. Maybe give some indication why you think the readership pact, or whatever you call it, has changed. 
And it changed in a, in a way that, 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 that the forms you would like to see, or maybe you want to see a thousand forms bloom, that they are the, that they are the new ways of sort of um, meeting the sensibilities and meeting them in a productive way, ethically and politically. That would be sort of the question. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Um, you might have to remind me of the first part because I wasn't sure, or I, I lost the precise question, but I'll, I'll try and answer. Maybe it, was, maybe it was unclear, sorry. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm a slightly tired as well, so it could be just that. Um, it's a good question how to um, demonstrate that academic histories, I mean, proper academic histories are read less. I, I don't have strong evidence for that, but my assumption is that because history as a popular reading, sort of popular history, is a bestseller now in, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, statistically by far. It seems to me that when historians more are also writing popular histories, there must be some reason for that. And they're writing less of these more traditional, academic, very seriously noted histories, or at least publishing less of them. That, that would, to me, suggest they're being read less as well. But that's, that is a projection on my part. So I, I don't have strong enough evidence to make it a big empirical claim. But um, yeah, only anecdotal evidence, I think, for this. But, but it seems to be mounting up the anecdotal evidence from, from actually many people here as well. That, uh, People just don't read histories. I've also had one of one of our colleagues present here say people don't read books anymore at all. So only articles. So that'd be. I'm looking at you, and I still remember. That. I I've come to agree with your claim about this that people don't read books from beginning to end anymore very much either. So so there's a lot of things that we should should be able to demonstrate better. But uh, yeah, I think I've taken it for granted. That this is the case because of the way other consumption patterns are going and the way that the styles that people consume in in mass are so different to to these more conservative histories but we should we should definitely investigate so right. yeah thank you very much and you might very well be right and it might be even a claim doubted if, if if people ever read whole books from from cover to cover but who knows maybe they did maybe they still do Okay, is there any further questions, concerns, comments? Nobody has raised a hand. Um, well, otherwise we have we have progressed well in time. That was great. Um, long discussion, long talk, that's great. Um, then I say again, um, thank you very much everybody for joining. Thank you very much, especially Carly for your talk. And please um, cons 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 uh, like consult our social media about the workshop coming up and everything else we do, if you're interested in what we're doing. And, See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.